My name is Per, I'm the founder of Small Improvements. I used to work for Atlassian before and then I started Small Improvements in 2010. I started off as the main developer of the product and now I've turned more into a product manager really. So I do a little of sales, a little of customer support, some development, but the main focus is to keep the focus of the product and move it forward. So Small Improvements makes feedback software for use inside other companies. So we have customers like Pinterest or Opera or Cloud and they use our tool to, to help employees gather feedback and give feedback to each other to learn what they're good at and to also learn at what they need to improve on. No, so uh, it all started with my savings in my bank account and uh, in the beginning we had considered raising money but we were just too small to be interesting to in for investors and now we are seeing a lot of uh, interest from investors but now it's like we're too big. Our main challenge is finding developers really and we don't need more money for that, we need to find more developers. <laughs> so. So the first year we didn't make no money at all, we just developed and prototyped. Then the second year we made a little money but not enough to cover expenses and only in the third year we started to making more money than we, when, than we spent. Um, we hired the first full-time person really only after one and a half years. It took a long time because we first wanted to make enough money to be able to pay them properly. Um, a friend of mine is doing uh, marketing for us, she's our director of marketing now. And she joined us maybe six or nine months into the company. And she's been super important for us. I mean, she's not a founder, but she is the key employee. And that's why I always say we. Because it is affordable. You can have a very nice office without breaking the budget. And there's always lots of people moving to Berlin. So there's a good choice of hiring good people here. We're eight people in the Berlin office. So uh, six developers and uh, myself and uh, office manager. But we're also three people in the US and two people in Australia who work freelance. And we're looking for developers now. So we would love to hire three developers, two back-end and one front-end developer still. <laughs> I think it's, it's very, very interesting work. We are dealing with lots of hard problems on the back end, for instance, all the non-functional stuff like performance and, and optimization and architecture. But also we're dealing with very interesting and demanding customers. And so there's always new projects every couple of weeks. I mean, sometimes we have new projects every day, but sometimes we have longer projects um, that, are, that are hard and challenging to work on. But when you solve them, you make customers happy and our customers love us. I think it's probably a, a close tie between Club Mate and, and Latte Macchiato. <laughs> so we have a very nice coffee machine, uh, but also some of the front-end developers drink a lot of Club Mate. It can't be healthy. And actually, I think it's important as a, as a founder, you have to be able to go on a vacation. Because, you, you know, you might go sick for a week or two, and you don't want the company to just die horribly just because you're sick for a month or two. Uh, or even a week or two. So I think, yeah, you know, during the first six months, it's fine if, if you're the main point of failure of a company. But after that, you should make sure that there's always someone else who can take over what you're doing. <laughs> no, not, not at all. No. So, um, no, I think my wife knows that I love this job and I would be miserable all day if I had to work at Siemens. I mean, I used to work at other startups and I liked it, but I think it's even better to, to work at, on your own project because you don't have to ask anyone for permission. I think in, in America and in Australia, it's more common at your job that you give each other feedback. Here, it's not so common. And you know, if you're doing a good job, you'll get a promotion in the, in the US, for instance, whereas here, you're doing a good job and nobody really cares. So it makes a mo more of a difference there if you're doing a good or a bad job. So I think that's one thing that, that plays into it. Then, of course, they're much more likely to start and try a new uh, new tools and also we have lots of startup companies as our customers and of course you know other startups are more likely to try new tools so I think that's why also we have so many customers in the Silicon Valley because they like to experiment and here we have less startups less startups that size and that means we have less customers here because I mean our product is really useful for companies with 50 or 100 employees it doesn't make much sense for someone who's just 10 people I mean, you can use it, it's free for 10 people, fair enough, but uh, the, the real value you get when you're 50 or 100 people, and it takes a long time in Europe to build a startup from, you know, from 10 to 50 or 100. In the US it goes overnight, 
we have customers who sign up and they have 30 people and then the next time they call us they are 100 and the next time they're 200 people okay. it's it's really crazy they're much they're growing so much faster um, we don't do much marketing really so um, it spreads by word of mouth so a customers happy tells their friends and so on uh, and once you have like 10 customers in the Silicon Valley then of course it spreads even more um, and uh, we we are talking to some clients here in in Germany now and I'm guessing once we get a few lighthouse customers here we'll start spreading here as well well so many even even technology startups often start off by using word files and sending them around and of course even if you're 10 people sending word files by mail is terrible uh, then when they grow and they have 50 people they realize this is not going to scale right? they can't be sending word files or excel spreadsheets to 50 100 200 people so the paperless thing and the ability to see where is the progress at that's definitely a big selling point it's also a very configurable product so you can really fine-tune it to your company a lot um, but then also what they love is that the end user who's using our product to give feedback or to solicit feedback uh, that's very streamlined so it's really really basic it's no frills you just go in there you click on the link in the mail you go and provide your feedback you save it and you're done so for the end user it's foolproof really and the funny thing is the more technical a company is, the more they want it to be really simple. That's, that's an interesting insight as well. So yeah, all the Pinterest in the world, they have smart people, but the smarter people are, the more they enjoy it if the product is simple. So at Atlassian, we had a very, very strong feedback culture. So it was very expected to, to give each other feedback on a daily basis anyway, face to face, of course, um, but also to wrap this up every quarter uh, so every quarter you'd either get feedback from your coworkers, uh, I as a manager from other managers as well, but also as a manager from your team. And in addition, every other quarter you would get feedback from your boss. Official feedback. Of course, you get feedback all the time, right? Every week, every day. Um, but in addition, you get extra feedback in written form. <coughs> and I love the process, um, but the tools we're using were just terrible. So that's when I came back to Germany, I said, well, Let's do something about it. Let's build something that's, that's nice to use. So when you provide the feedback, you can see who will be able to see it, right? By default, it's maybe the person that you're giving feedback to and the manager. But it doesn't mean that everyone in the company can see the feedback. We have a feature where you can also praise someone publicly if you like, but you don't have to use it. And the, the more sensitive stuff, like what did the person not do well, where could they improve on, that's always just visible to that person and their manager, or maybe even only to their manager. Because of course, yeah, it's good to get positive feedback. You need that too. But you also need to find out where are my weak spots, what should I improve on? And that's usually not public. The, the 2D chart that we're using is really just a way to start the conversation, to see, well, where do I think I stand? And where does my manager think where I stand? And then are we in the, more or less the same region, or is there a huge gap? And if there's a huge gap, then you have something to talk about already. Yeah. So if I could maybe poach people from another startup, then it would definitely be SoundCloud because they have the same uh, level of, um, of expectations to their developers. I would, I would love to steal their, you know, their development team. <laughs> so, so we always go to a small cafe, a restaurant called Pförtner which is nearby and it has really good food and we love going there, so we go there every day. When I started the company, we had uh, my savings account and after nine months, it was almost at zero. So that was very close and we managed to get back up. But that also, mm, well, since then, I've been very, very careful of our cash flow and not to hire people too early. Only hire people when you know, okay, you can actually pay their salaries for the next couple of months or a year, definitely and um, we make sure that we have enough money in the bank always to be able to cover at least three months of salaries without having any problem. Uh, it was a small consulting company. Um, they started like two weeks before Atlassian started. So we got lots of good feedback from those before we then rolled it out to Atlassian, which was a big challenge back then. Um, those two customers, they don't pay us money even till today. They just are, you know, they, they were the first ones to try us, so they didn't have to pay. And then the first paying customer that was, yeah, maybe
maybe one year after I started prototyping, and that was a small American um, consulting company as well. But then soon after, I think Quicksilver was our fifth customer or so, so it started getting more interesting very quickly and more demanding, and Opera was customer number 10 maybe. So what we did was we, we did spend a lot of effort on SEO and we did Facebook ads and LinkedIn ads and Google AdWords and so on, but it always attracted the wrong customer kind, always the wrong people signing up, always having stupid questions, not understanding what the product is. Um, but since we had Atlassian as a first customer and they were happy, they started telling their friends or other people they met at conferences. They did a one blog post and we even now, three years later, we're still getting lots of very high quality to high quality evaluators from that blog post, from one blog post three years ago. Um, so word of mouth is really important for us. It's, yeah, we'd rather spend all our efforts on making the product really nice so people like it and tell others, rather than, you know, paying Google or Facebook lots of money on advertising. It just doesn't work for us. So we, we hire developers that can code, obviously, but we also try to only hire people who also have their own side projects where they learn how to develop you know, their own features or their own game or whatnot. Um, because it's important that you understand not only the code but also the user experience. And we want everyone to understand what makes a good product. I'm sitting in front of a computer, I think. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea how, how the company, how far we'll take it. So maybe I'll still be sitting here, who knows. Um, if the company doesn't exist, I'll be at, I don't know, doing some other project, I think. So I mean, I love being on the beach. I used to live near the beach for three years. I want to do that again, but I don't just lie on the beach and do nothing. It's too boring. Oh, we have a huge pipeline of features that we want to build, so it's a great product. But there's all these things that can go better. So the overview screens, we're rewriting them from scratch because we want them to be even better. We want to build more integrations with other products. So for instance, if your company is using Zendesk, then we want to display Zendesk data when you're getting feedback from someone so they can see, oh, that person did all these support tickets. Awesome, thumbs up. Um, we want to build similar integrations with other products as well, Salesforce, for instance. And um, Ah, yeah, all these features that customers want. I mean, you have to be careful not to add too many features. So we do want to stick with the four main modules we have, um, but we want to make them so much better still. Uh, we're using uh, Java on Google App Engine. So that's the back end. We're using Jersey for, for the REST API that we're building. On the front end, we're using AngularJS and lots of HTML and CSS, obviously. Um, we're starting to move from Grunt to Gulp, so we're always trying to use the the latest and hottest uh, technology. Um, and uh, what else? Well, it's all on our website. We have uh, all our tools listed there, so I don't know what comes to mind. Phantom JS for testing and Karma for testing and all these front-end tools. I, I lose track sometimes. There's so much. <laughs> um, we will be looking for more customer success uh, people, but that's going to be in the US. So we have two or three people in the US now uh, doing customer success, like you know, answering tickets, doing demos, meeting customers, asking them about their needs. Um, and then we have two people in Australia, one yeah, a director of marketing and one mobile app developer. Um, we might hire another marketing per person in, in Sydney, but in Berlin we're, we're focusing on development. Uh, it's basically the Atlassian model, right? I mean, of course, if someone signs up for a demo, then you want to show them what the product can do, and you will, if, if they sounded interested, then you will follow up after two weeks or four weeks. But we don't want to bombard them with mails, and we certainly don't want to, you know, call people on the phone ten times until they, I don't know, until they hate you. We don't do that. And we don't do outbound um, telemarketing, for instance, either. We feel we have so many sign-ups for the trial version anyway, we have to get better at converting those. Maybe we we're converting 5%. I would rather convert 10% of those who sign up than calling another 4,000 people and saying, oh, can you try our software? It just doesn't make sense. We have so many people who are interested already, we have to get better at converting them to making them happy customers. So in Berlin, we speak German because we are 
almost all German. Uh, and I think we'll keep that for a while because we're all native German speakers. So why should we all speak English? Because one person doesn't understand German. I mean, it should be, I don't know. Um, we're looking for, I mean, we're, we're fine to hire people who are not from Berlin or not from Germany, but you should be able to understand basic German, I think, to work here. Other than that, I mean, the company, the, the intranet is in English, documentation is in English, all customers are in the US and Australia. And it, of course, in, in, in Australia, we have uh, one guy who's Australian, one is German. And in, in the US, we have two Americans and one German. Um, and of course, we speak English all the time with them. Okay. It's too much work. <laughs> it's so much work to get funding. And if you're a single founder, then, and you have, People who say, well, we might buy your product if you add a few more features, then it feels like, well, you should focus on the product and build what customers want and not spend half your day for a, for a couple of months trying to get funding from, from the state. I understand there's, there's definitely companies where it makes sense to get funding, but for us it just made sense to just focus on the product, code as fast as possible, and then sell it. Um, so sometimes I meet other founders who do get funding, but they get slowed down a lot by that. So they have more money after working for it half a year, but you know, in that half year, maybe they lost the ability to dominate a market because there's always competition. And um, it also it seemed like you have to go through so many hoops to get funded by the state. Um, you know, you can do it, and maybe they still tell you no, and you've just spent a couple of months working on it. It's risky too, I think. If you're maybe two or three co-founders, uh, you know, one does technology, one does marketing, and one does funding, fundraising, that's different, that might work. But if you're a single founder, mm, hard, I think. I mean, we, we have been contacted by, I don't know, 30 VCs by now, and there's always a catch. They want a board seat, they want more shares than you think they should have, and uh, they're all very nice and all very smart, but uh, ultimately they all want something, of course the business and it feels like the, there's always a catch and you don't you would like to take the money but you don't want to deal with the downsides of it that's why we never took funding it took us a year till we got a credit card that was very embarrassing because well I mean you have to buy stuff online right you have to we have to buy software licenses and we have to pay by credit card. So uh, for one year I had to use my private credit card because our bank just said no. Well, you know, you're, you're a GmbH, okay, you gave us 20,000 euro, but we don't think you deserve a credit card. I didn't expect that. That was really bad. I was very unhappy. We have been working successfully with freelancers all over the world so far. Um, but now that we want to also rent an office in, in the US, you can only do that if you have a, a, a company there. They will not give you. They they won't rent out uh, an office to someone who's you know overseas. So we and also we want to start hiring people full time in the U.S. Um, so for that we are going to set up a U.S. subsidiary uh, company, and we have started talking to lawyers. It's all these boring things you have to do at some point, but <laughs> it's it sounds glamorous maybe to have a company over there, but it's not. It's just legal paperwork. It's boring. I've not been to the States in five years. So, and I started the company three years ago, so yeah. And I was in Australia once, but that was more because it was winter here and I thought, let's go to the beach. <laughs> so I went back to my old place there and uh, worked from there for a month. And it, it, it was fun because we were able to meet customers there, but it's not so important that the founder goes and meet the customers. I mean, we do Skype calls sometimes. I do calls with key customers. But we have hired very carefully and we have very good representatives over mm -hmm. there. So usually mm, Scott or James just go to meet our customers over there and that's just as good, I think. And we're very good at communicating internally. We're using all these tools, you know, intranet tools to share information all the time. And uh, so it feels like I've been at the meeting sometimes. I just read the notes and I feel like, oh, okay, yeah, that was a good meeting. I don't have to be there. <laughs>